Hello, and welcome to an introduction to person-centered planning. After this presentation, you will have a basic understanding of person-centered philosophy and using a strength-based approach. You will also have a brief understanding of the transformation the state of Alabama has begun as of October 1st, 2020, and how that transformation affects the role of the support coordinator and what the process, the tools, and how affected stakeholders, including providers, will be introduced as part of the transformation. First, let's start with the definition of person-centered planning. According to the National Quality Forum, person-centered planning is an approach to organizing a person's supports and services so they can live the kind of life they want for themselves. To create a person-centered planning program, we need to have a positive or a strength-based approach used by everyone. The individual who's receiving supports should be supported to lead the process as much as they desire. The conversations and plan should be all about the individual's goals, dreams, needs, wants, the things they like and do not like, and what is important in their life. And finally, the person must be supported to think of the kind of life they want. They may not know many of these things on their own, especially if they have not been able to experience many things or had not been given many choices in their life. As we look at the person-centered approach for the Alabama Department of Mental Health, we looked at it in four different steps. The first step is the conversation. And the conversation guide is a tool that was created to support support coordinators in having conversations with individuals about the life they would like to live. It's a guide for conversation led by the individual rather than a document that they record responses on. The second step in the process is the assessment that is completed within Adidas. And this is where the responses and the essential items to meet administrative code and organizational policies is documented. The third step is through the conversation, support coordinators are also gonna be identifying what individuals can do on their own, what natural supports they have, and what paid supports are needed. And ultimately, all of those conversations and identification of supports and services needed lead to the person-centered plan. This will be the summary of all of the hopes, goals, and dreams the individual has and that will live as the living, breathing document that is the person-centered plan and will be continually updated as needs, wants, and goals and outcome achievement is achieved. So you might be wondering why Alabama is going through this transformation. And there's a couple of primary reasons. One reason is around compliance and the other is about person-centered planning being the right thing to do. Let's start by looking at the compliance piece. In March of 2014, a new federal rule was implemented, adding additional requirements for the delivery of Medicaid home and community-based services. This ruling is about a shift in the way services are delivered to be more focused on true community integration opportunities for those who are receiving institutional services. This ruling is also where the need for deconflicted case management and person-centered planning come from. And these are two ways in which the Alabama Department of Health can move towards meeting this goal. So you might be thinking, if this went into effect in March of 2014, why are we just hearing about it now? These requirements were just guidance for the past few years. However, now the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, known as CMS, is mandating everyone come into full compliance with this ruling. This new request simply makes the previous guidance provided within the ruling required rather than optional. Now looking at the second piece I mentioned, person-centered planning is an approach to organizing supports and services so the person can live the kind of life they want for themselves. You may be aware that Alabama Department of Mental Health has made previous attempts to implement person-centered planning since the ruling in 2014, but for various reasons, those previous attempts were identified as not meeting the needs of the various stakeholders. 
especially when we looked at the area surrounding identifying more opportunities for integration for individuals in Alabama. Lastly, I just wanted to mention here, when we talk about compliance, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services ruling also requires that agencies ensure they are offering at least one non-disability specific service anytime a disability specific service is offered and requires that they document that a non-disability specific service was offered. In other words, if something like residential or day habilitation is authorized on an individual's plan, the requirement asks that it is documented a conversation was had with the individual about other more integrated opportunities for service options that could meet the same need. Speaking of offering more opportunities, let's take a look at where the state of Alabama is currently with true community integration. Did you know Alabama ranks 41st in the country in keeping families together for individuals in the program? This means many people in the program are not necessarily living with their families. Alabama ranks 50th in the country in promoting productivity for individuals in the program. This means Alabama ranks last in offering individual opportunities for competitive and integrative employment. We also note that there are over 2,000 people on the waiting list to receive services and support. And 90% of the funding for the program is currently spent on residential and day habilitation services. And less than 1% of funding is spent on supported employment, community experience, benefits and career counseling and pre-vocational services. I think we can all agree we have a stronger vision for Alabama than when we're where we currently are. So since the later part of 2019, the Alabama Department of Mental Health has partnered with ANOVA to create a system transformation to move pro towards person-centered planning. And the first step in this partnership with ANOVA, which is a consulting organization based out of the state of Wisconsin, with over 20 years of experience with person-centered planning, was identifying what goals and vision Alabama was working towards. And the vision that was co-created was by 2025, Alabamians receiving supports through the waiver will be engaged and empowered to build a plan and a vision for their own life. This will occur through an easily facilitated approach to person-centered planning where individuals have a voice, are informed of all possibilities, and experience dignity of risk as they reach their life goals. After we had the vision co-created, we had to establish a set of core values to build a foundation and hold ourselves accountable to moving towards the vision we created. And these five values are as follows. First, transparency. We are committed to proactively sharing the vision, the goals and approaches through clear and concise information with all stakeholders affected by our decisions and actions. Relationships. We're committed to building a foundation of trust through shared understanding and mutual respect. Innovation. We will actively seek out creative solutions and support an environment where all stakeholders are empowered to build new and bold practices. Collaboration. We will ensure everyone has an equal voice and shared responsibility through collaboration with all internal and external stakeholders leading to better outcomes for all. And finally, integrity. We will reach alignment of our vision goals and approaches and continually seek out honest evaluations of how programs are being administered and impacting the lives of Alabamians and the communities in which they live. A move to person-centered planning takes a large shift in thinking for everyone involved throughout the process. Person-centered planning is moving from transactional work where we are just gathering information to fill our documentation needs to conversational work where support coordinators are intensely interested in the individual story and the family story as they tell it in their own words and images. And these stories are told through a series of conversations 
that build trust and allow support coordinators to really get to know the individual so they can live the kind of life they want for themselves. Now you might think we would start talking next about the tools we created unique to Alabama. However, the success of person-centered planning is much more than a tool or a list of questions to ask someone. So let's spend some time looking at what person-centered planning is. While person-centered planning can encompass many things, we wanna outline what it is and what it is not to help us start getting a clear vision of what we all strive to achieve. Person-centered planning is organized around the person's defined preferred life. It is not organized around the professional's defined best life possible for the person. It is not just about exploring hopes, dreams, and goals. It also includes looking at all areas of someone's life and looking at what is standing in the way of achieving goals also. It is strength-based and we build on the strength, skills, and resources of an individual to overcome challenges. It is not deficit or problem-based. So we do not focus on the person's problems or attempt to fix people. It is a team approach. The person and a group of the person's choosing work together to explore the person's ideal, set goals, strategize, create an action plan, and celebrate success. It is not a one-size-fits-all list of qualifications that determines service authorization, approval, or denial. It is full citizenship. It is not about segregation and ableism. And ableism, if you're not familiar, is the discrimination or prejudice against individuals with disabilities. An example of ableism is when a person's opinion is dismissed because they have a disability. It is self-determination and the right to take risks. It is not a power over approach to ensure health and safety. It is challenging the norm and looking toward a more inclusive future. It is not about being complacent with the status quo. At its foundation, person-centered planning is about supporting people to live their preferred life. It's not about trying to strive for the perfect or best life where we have everything we ever wanted because that's not realistic for any of us. It is about helping individuals identify the life they want and supporting them to get there. Before we go any further, we wanna talk about a strength-based approach as this is the core foundation of person-centered planning. So much so that some people use strength-based approach and person-centered planning as terms interchangeably. It was once said that if we ask people to look for their deficits, they will usually find them and their view of the situation will be colored by this. If we ask people to look for their successes, they will usually find it, and their view of the situation will be colored by this. In many ways, our traditional model of care embraces the belief that people need help because they actually have a problem. This emphasis on deficits or what a person is lacking leads to a cycle of focusing only on what needs need to be repaired, followed by some assumed solutions. It's a deficit approach that says, I need to fix you. When we do that, though, we actually deny people the opportunity to face the challenge and actually learn from it and discover things about themselves that they're going to need in order to resolve that situation in a way that actually looks like success for them. More recently, care providers and organizations have embraced this new strengths perspective and what it means to work with people and promote positive change. Rather than that more traditional model of fixing, it's more about actually focusing on people and understanding what strengths they bring to the picture, what capacities that we can draw upon that actually they will use in ways to transform their own lives in positive ways. It's important to understand that a strength-based perspective is not about a denying challenges, but it actually sees challenges as an opportunity to grow. When problems become the starting point of change, then we tend to label people. There's a dependency that occurs. And it's always about drawing upon others in order to resolve their issues. But when we look at strengths, when we look at those things that people bring to the picture, they are then able to embrace it in ways that they understand. In many ways, this shift to a strength-based perspective changes the way we work with people. It's about working with people and facilitating rather than trying to fix their issues. It's about looking for signs of health rather than signs of risk. And it's about moving away from labels which limit people's options. 
It invites asking very different questions that are more curious, exploratory, and hopeful. The strengths approach as a philosophy of practicing draws one away from an emphasis on procedures, techniques, knowledge as the keys to change. It's not expert driven. It reminds us that every person, family group, community are the keys to their own transformation and meaningful change. The real challenge and always has been whether we are willing to fully embrace a different way of approaching people and working with them. If we do, then the change starts with us in the helping profession, not with those we serve. Embracing a strength-based approach involves a different way of thinking about people, interpreting their patterns of coping with life challenges. With a strength-based mindset, one asks different questions and communicates in a way that invites a curious exploration based upon a clear set of values and attitudes. It's about exploring what can be as opposed to why not. As outlined in the video, when we shift from the traditional deficit-based support model to a strength-based approach, it shifts mindsets from a disability equals limitation to the focus on an individual's strengths. It turns the impossible into possible. A strength-based focused approach is important because it focuses up is on the kind of life that individuals prefer to live and the support needed to live that life which is foundational to person-centered planning. This approach is not just limited to how we interact with the individuals enrolled in our programs. We use this approach with all stakeholders, like the families, providers, and coworkers we interact with and who interact with the people being supported. As we have said, person-centered planning is not about a tool. The success lies within the ability for a support coordinator to have a successful strength-based assessment conversation. In order for this to occur, we'll, we, need, we'll need to have a focus on the actions, competencies, and mindsets needed to support person-centered planning. As we look at the competencies on the screen, you can see several different items noted. First, looking at building relationships and how critical those are. Yielding control, not having the power over approach. Facilitating conversations as support coordinator versus managing the conversation. Using resilience and empathy. Presuming competence, understanding, supporting risk, being self-aware and challenging the norm. As you can see on the far right, both learn and educate is there. To be successful, we need to learn ourselves but also teach all those around us the importance of understanding these competencies and the basic foundations of person-centered planning. Before we go too much further though, let's look at a traditional versus a person-centered planning approach. If you look at a traditional approach, the focus is usually on eligibility, meeting administrative code and compliance and contractual requirements. The format is a questionnaire of some kind in which there is questions and answers to close-ended questions and documentation of those answers. And it's usually taken from the perspective of the support coordinator or the professional who is doing the assessment. A person-centered approach shifts the focus from learning from the person about their self-defined vision for their preferred life and relationship building. And the format of this new way of doing things is looking at assessment conversations with open-ended conversation. And documentation of those conversations is summarized by the support coordinator within the Adidas system. And the perspective is not the support coordinator or the, or the professional, it's the perspective of the individual receiving support. As we look at an overview of the assessment process, first and foremost, the process starts with the person at the center of the person-centered planning. The person drives the assessment process by selecting who is involved, determining to what extent they would like to lead the process, what information they feel comfortable sharing, and the pace of the assessment conversation. The support coordinator's role would be to support the person with exploring what this leadership might look like for the individual. 
And they will have to keep in mind that this could be uncomfortable or maybe even confusing for individuals who have never been asked to participate or facilitate or even thought about it. So they may want to consider providing examples of ways the person can lead the process to assist them in making an informed decision about their participation. The level of leadership is individualized to each person and some options how, how they might be included or facilitate could be the person could run their meetings completely by taking the role of inviting team members, arranging for a meeting location, developing an agenda, facilitating the agenda, taking notes, et cetera. Another option is it could be more of a partnership between the support coordinator and the person in which they share responsibilities about facilitation. Or finally, it might be an evolving process in which the support coordinator builds a relationship and helps teach the person how to lead their meetings. And as they learn more, they could take more of a leadership role. It's important as we look at the next diagram here to ensure the right people are involved in the assessment conversation. The person, their legal decision maker when applicable, and the support coordinator always will be part of the conversation. From there, the person can choose anyone else they identify that could bring value to the conversation. The key here is the team does not become the center. They surround the center with support. The team members surround the person to provide any support needed to ensure the person stays at the center of the planning process. Always remember the saying as it goes, nothing about us without us. Together the person and their team will focus on five key areas. And these five key areas are called life domains. Because as I mentioned earlier, the federal ruling requires that non-disability specific services are offered we need to fully explore all of these five domains. The five domains include daily life. Daily life includes interests, work, hobbies, sports, entertainment, and education or learning something new. Community living. This domain includes living situation, preferences, privacy, access to possessions in all areas within the home, including the yard, pets, safety, and finances. Community connections. This domain includes creating and maintaining relationships, community contributions such as volunteering, and culture values and spiritual beliefs. The healthy living domain covers overall health, allergies, medications, cognition and memory, mental health and EODA, behavioral support planning, and crisis plans. The self-determination domain covers self-advocacy, exercising rights, freedom from abuse and neglect, and dignity of risk. Within each life domain, the person on their team will discuss the person's related values, strengths, needs and goals. In person-centered planning, we call the person's goals outcomes. After outcomes are developed, the person on their team work together to identify barriers and then tap into their creative thinking skills to brainstorm strategies to overcome any barriers identified in order to achieve their outcomes. These are all components of the assessment conversation. The information support coordinators capture from their assessment conversations will then flow into the person-centered plan. And this process of understanding an individual's strengths, outcomes, barriers, and strategies will be the foundation of the person-centered plan and conversations. Let's focus a little bit more on the tool that was created specific and unique to Alabama to support support coordinators in having assessment conversations. First, we wanna talk a little bit about the intent of the conversation guide. And the first is that it was designed to be a power shift from the focus from a case manager 
led facilitation to a person-led facilitation. And as we said earlier, the traditional assessment tools had previously been designed to assist the professional or the support coordinator to complete the assessment. However, this guide was developed as a tool to support the person on their team to complete the assessment process together. In other words, it is a shift from doing something to the person to doing something with a person. And the intent of this guide supports the person to be able to pick where they want to start conversations and where they want to start sharing information about their preferred life rather than starting where the professional or the support coordinator wants to start and simply just answering yes or no questions. Next, the person-centered planning guide also helps support coordinators shift from a checkbox assessment process to a less formal conversation. And the intent of the guide is not to ask every question or that you can only ask the specific questions within the guide, it's intended to meet the individual where they're at in their person-centered planning journey. And the support coordinators may have other questions they want to ask to help guide the conversation. They may look to the provider or other individuals within the individual's life to ask questions or provide input and just ask follow-up questions. And for some individuals, the support coordinator may just ask one question, which will lead to very rich conversation. And for others, support coordinators may need to ask multiple questions to gather the information needed. The person-centered planning guide was also designed to inspire conversation about in integration. As we had talked about earlier with the HCBS settings rule, prompting questions and cues were provided within each of the life domains in the conversation guide to ensure that we can spark a holistic exploration of options available, to help support the person's right to exercise choice and self-determination. And last, but definitely not least, this guide was also designed to help foster future forward thinking. As you probably have noted throughout this presentation, roles have changed. And historically, the QDDPs led the conversation, and now we have said the person receiving supports will lead the conversation with assistance from the support coordinator. So we thought we should spend some time outlining the role of a support coordinator. The role includes helping the team to work together to include refocusing the team on the person's goals and making sure others' goals or agendas do not take center stage, and that it, the focus is kept on the individual and what they want and desire. It also, the role includes using negotiation and conflict resolution skills to ensure collaboration. It includes encouraging the team to celebrate strengths and successes. Advocating to ensure the individual stays at the center is, and is offered the ability to live their preferred life. It is the role to assist the team to gather the information needed for the person-centered planning process, including defining the present state, identifying the person's strengths, capabilities, assets, and resources, describing the person's desired future state, and looking for barriers to overcome for achieving the future state. As we have talked about, partnerships are critical. Support coordinators will need to work with the individual and all those around them, including those working most closely with them like providers to truly understand an individual's hopes, goals, needs, and wants, and also to review progress towards goals once they have been identified. So although the QDDP role has shifted some of the role in PCP to the support coordinator, the QDDP is still very critical to the success of each individual in helping to identify goals and with the delivery of the services to help individuals achieve their goals. And as we look a little bit further at the support coordinator role, it is about them helping to identify resources to meet unmet needs and to ensure effective resource use with the person and their team. 
It isn't about having all the answers. Again, they need to depend on others, including potentially the providers to help in the process. It's about adapting a how might we mindset, not about being complacent with gaps in support and services or being stuck when we can't identify a provider to deliver the outcome or work towards the goal completion. It is about building partnerships and not about doing it all on their own. This type of out-of-the-box thinking will take some practice for everyone. It will require everyone look at solutions in a way that they may have not before. It will be about adopting a how might we mindset and encouraging others to do the same. The shift to person-centered planning is not intended to be traveled alone. It will require a high level of partnership, not only with the person and their team, but also with the people in the community, providers, coworkers, and subject matter experts. The support coordinator's role is to identify resources to meet unmet needs and to ensure effective resource use with the person and their team. It is not acceptable to just insert people into available and standardized services because we're not aware of the options or there isn't currently a specific support offered in the person's community. Similar to what we have been saying about the importance of having multiple conversations to build relationships and help individuals identify their goals and outcomes, we believe it also takes just as much time to identify solutions to helping individuals meet their outcomes. It is not reasonable to believe a support coordinator can be aware of and ready to deliver all of the strategies. It's most important to identify all the possibilities, regardless of whether they exist, and then develop a plan to work towards them. This is changing the role of the support coordinators as we look to push past our two most common services in Alabama, which are residential and day habilitation, and explore more integrated opportunities within all of the life domain sections. Once possible strategies are identified and all possible strategies are reviewed, the person and their team will explore what is the most effective and cost-effective option from the brainstorm together. And this exploration will include discussing the pros and cons of each strategy, maintaining focus on the person's outcomes, and looking at solutions in multiple ways. The most effective and cost-effective strategy could just be one solution or a combination of options. And always support coordinators should be analyzing if the strategies are the right support in the right amount and at the right time. Before we wrap up and talk about the final step in the person-centered process, which is the documentation in Adidas, we just want to pause with a few reminders. We've intentionally spent most of our time focusing on the competencies and skills needed and the importance of the assessment conversation. This is because the assessment conversation is where the magic happens in person-centered planning. The assessment documentation in Adidas is just a written accord of the assessment conversations that took place. And the documentation in Adidas is truly just a byproduct of the conversation. As we look at the assessment documentation in Adidas, as we've said, this is just a summary of all the information that was gathered. There's going to be multiple documents, multiple conversations that were reviewed as a part of person-centered planning that will need to be summarized within the documentation tool within Adidas. Support coordinators will be leaning on several different individuals as a part of the team to ensure they have the information they need to document successfully. This might include providers submitting information. It could be review of medical records. It could be review of medication logs and summaries. Could be many different things to make up what is needed to have a holistic and final summary of the person-centered planning process. Thank you for your time. This presentation was recorded in collaboration with the Alabama Department of Mental Health and ANOVA. Thank you.